Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everybody, welcome to the Team House. This is episode 115. I'm Jack Murphy, here with Dave Park. Our guest tonight is Mick Mulroy. Mick served as a CIA paramilitary operations officer. He was a U.S. Marine, and he also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. So we're really excited to have Mick here today. Uh, we had him on once previously when we were talking about uh, the veterans who were helping our Afghan allies evacuate from the country and get to the United States. Um, now we're having Mick back to actually have a, a more normal Team House episode to talk about his life and career, and we're excited to have you here. Thank you, man. Hey, thanks, Jack. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you guys again. <laughs> so the question we ask all of our guests, Mick, about their origin story, tell us about where you came from and how you found your way into the Marines and eventually the agency. Uh, so, you know, it was an odd, it was an odd journey. I'd have to say I, I was actually born in Haight Ashbury in 1967. So if, if, if you guys are familiar with that, that was like the hippie oh, yeah. capital of the universe at the time. Right? Oh, yeah. So my dad was a graduate student at San Francisco and Berkeley. And so, um, needless to say, I'll skip through a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, by the time I decided to join the Marine Corps, my parents were already like, WTF kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but, but as you referenced before, I am from an Irish American ilk and service is, as you all know, is, uh, is something that's really, really, um, respected in our ethnic group. So we had a lot of, we had a lot of people that served in the military. What, so was there, totally was there like a time? To, I mean, did you want to be in the military growing up or did you? Was there a time in your life when that shifted and you decided to go that way? You know, I was all over the place. I mean, I, I don't, I, I would pretty much, I didn't grow up like just saying I'm going to be in the military and that's it. Um, I grew up all over the country, you know, California, Massachusetts, Georgia, but I did have like a, a I think a lot of people that joined the military, I had a, like a feeling to be something bigger, be a part of something bigger, you know, um, be part of a team and to serve, quite frankly. It's not, it wasn't any more than that. You know, I, was, I just wanted to serve, do my, do my part. And, and that was it. You know, I didn't really think much deeper than that. Um, but, and then, you know, I went in, I went in the Marine Corps buddy program with one of my best friends. Uh, and then of course, when we actually were about to ship off, they told us the Marine Corps doesn't have a buddy program. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw him like the entire time. Of basic training, I was like, <laughs> We would have had a better chance to sign it up. And, you know, we were just joking the other day that when we were at MEPS, um, we, we were looking for the Marine line and we couldn't find it. And the Army Staff Sergeant there, it said, he said, that's because you two are it. <laughs> there isn't anybody else on the Marine line. Of course, we looked at each other going, you know, damn, maybe we should have thought this through. <laughs> but anyway, I love being a Marine. I love having served in the Marine Corps. My son's now a Marine. You know, my brother-in-law is a Marine. So it's, it's uh, you know, it was it was really the right choice, you know, looking back at it. And when you went into the Marine Corps, uh, what you, did you, you went in enlisted initially? Yeah, I was enlisted uh, for six years. I was an infantry guy. I was a, a tanker and 60A3. When we went through tank school at Fort Knox, the Army already had the tank in the museum, right. you know, which, uh, you know, that was the last thing we did was went to the museum and said, hey, damn, isn't that our tank? It was a good tank, though. It was a good tank. It didn't break, like, you know, like the a room, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I did that uh, in, in for six years, and then, and then uh, you know, I looked to go into school, finish college, go to law school, that kind of stuff. So you went I'm not really to... used to talking about myself. No, that's honest. okay. Well, no, <laughs> I mean, I... you know, it's one of those things that it, it kind of, you know, I could talk policy all day long, but talking about myself kind of makes it's me. It's okay. Uh, this is uh, that's what I, I hope makes this show a little unique. Is kind of we'd like to hear about you know where where these folks come out of and how they find themselves in odd places in yeah, life. Yeah, and I feel your pain. I, I feel the same yeah. way. So, uh, um, yeah. Well, what um, 
was there so you went did did you go to law school prior to get uh, getting commissioned or did you yeah yeah so I, I i went to law school then i became you know what's called a judge advocate in the marine corps and then i went you know back to my original and when it became an infantry officer right so that that was my career in the in the marine corps uh, so enlisted uh commissioned as a judge advocate and infantry officer and then I know some people were like, ah, it sounds like a Tom Clancy novel, but I was literally with a priest in an Irish pub when I met a guy who worked, and it was a setup with the priest who actually knew him, uh, who worked at the agency. <laughs> and he was like, what are you going to do when you get out of the Marine Corps? I'm like, well, I didn't know I was getting out of the Marine Corps. <laughs> he goes, well, if you do, you know, um, you know, he gave me the cocktail napkin. He wrote his fax machine. So back in the days of fax machines, he said, send your resume here. I was like, okay, I don't really know where here is, but I kind of figured it out because, you know, the guy was being kind of cool. But he did. I mean, he seemed to let me know enough to know that. And that's that's how it started, right? So that's, I sent my resume in and um, went up and did the interviews just like everybody else. And I started before, it's like 1999. You know? That's pretty interesting. So, you got recruited like the old fashioned way. That's how the CIA used to recruit by hand. Right. Yeah. That's what I felt like, you know, people like that really happened. Yeah, it totally happened. It's not just some Irish stuff story. I swear I could bring the priest out. He won't lie. Right. Uh, he'll tell you. He's like, yeah, nope, that happened. It was a total setup. It was at Murphy's, you know, so I'm sure you guys know Murphy's. <laughs> Every brain cycle kind of knows Murphy's. But that, um, but yeah, so that's how it happened. You know, I was, you know, growing up, and that's one of the things I really did want to talk about is because I know your audience is, is, is I think is going to be some of the folks that we'd really like to target in a good way, uh, recruit, uh, to the agency, perhaps to the paramilitary part of it. But, you know, the agency has a lot of opportunities, not just the paramilitary folks like myself. Well, init um, init initially though, uh, I mean, did you go in as a, as a case officer or were you a paramilitary officer from the get go? So, you know, I went as an OO. And then, quite frankly, I was there. I was in training on 9-11. And I think they were looking at me as an option. You know, I, and, you know most of the PMOs, uh, as you may know, but for your audience, are out of, you know, the Green Berets, Rangers, SEALs, Recon Marines, MARSOC. Now, MARSOC wasn't around back then. Um, and then they do have some straight-out infantry guys, both Army and Marine. That's what I was, right? So, you know, I think... Quite frankly, I was there on 9-11, and there wasn't a lot of paramilitary guys back then. Like, you could fit us all in a room. So it was it was kind of circumstance, you know. They said, hey, can you can you ride a horse? And I was like, hell yeah, I can ride a horse. And I totally could not ride a horse. <laughs> it was definitely a horse too. But I was like, I'll do it. Because I happened on 9-11. I, I was at the farm. Yeah. And they were like, hey, man, you're getting your chance because we need a lot more guys going to Afghanistan like today so it was just like the class before me and the class after me everybody that was in the what they call a paramilitary designated slot you know you go you become an oo which is um, as you know but for your audience uh, that's that's the folks they were they would recruit to come in and train so they can you know spot assess develop and recruit run assets both for uh, intelligence collection and covert action and then the PMOO, we do all that. And then we're also kind of the, the uh, CIA's version of special operations. So, so we do everything so like the, that. I'm sorry. The so the yeah. OO is an operations officer, also kind of called a case officer, or, or you, you know, was. Right. And then a PMOO is a paramilitary operations officer. Is that correct? Okay. So the old term, uh, and people will hear it so they're not confused. An operations officer is what, like you said, what used to be called a case officer, but people use the terms interchangeably. And now you have like a desk officer is called a staff operations officer and a case man a reports officer is now called a case management officer. Those are all within the DO, so the directorate of operations. And a PMO is just one small, small part of that. And that's what I had the, you know, the privilege to be for my career. Uh, but again, uh, they usually look at the people from the backgrounds already referenced, um, plus some, you know, conventional infantry folks. 
Uh, you get trained to be an O, you get trained to be a paramilitary, paramilitary officer. That course is pretty extensive. But it's more more of a, I don't want to say a gentleman's course, but everybody they hire has already gone through their, you know, gut check course. Right. So they don't, it's not a selection in the sense that they drop a lot of people because they've already, you know, people have already, you know, came from Delta Force, you know, and they've been go to OO and then they just want everybody to be on the same sheet of music. So the right. PM course, and I don't want to get beyond what I'm supposed to talk about recruiting, but the PM course is, it's long, it's extensive. You learn a lot, but it's not about necessarily weeding folks off because they've already, I mean, the U.S. government's already invested it's done on it. You know, they don't want to. And then you, then you have a career uh, being both a paramilitary person and an ops officer, which means you will serve in the conflict areas and austere environments, but you can also have a chance to go serve in stations in nice places like Paris, and, you know, places like that. So it's, it's a super cool career. And for people that are already in special operations in the military, I think they should take a look at it. Uh, it's, it we not have a lot of people, but we, we try to select the right people. That's, that's the best, uh, best recruiting tool we have. And then for the people in our audience who might be thinking about the agency, who might think that maybe, well, I don't have a military background, they can still go like a standard operations officer route. Oh, yeah. And, and have, you know, have a lot of fun and have the, the agency experience. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. So they can, the, the PMOO does essentially require a military background. And they, and they now look for like 10 years of special operations experience for a PMOO. A paramilitary specialist, um, I can't go too deep into that, but those are people who usually do an entire career in, in, in retire as a, you know, a master chief or sergeant major, you know, Delta SEAL team, you know, fill in the blank MARSOC. Uh, and they come back and they just do the paramilitary stuff. And together there's a team, PMOs and PM specialists. And those folks, you know, quite frankly, and I was a PMO, not a PM specialist. Those folks are like the unsung heroes, in my opinion, of the entire war. I mean, these guys did 20 years, you know, on the, you know, serving in the U.S. military special operations, they had 20 more years serving in the agency. And some of those guys, I mean, they're still, they're still out there. They're still out there poking and jabbing. It's salty. It's, it's astonishing. They're salty, yeah. salty guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, Super impressive. And the the those guys are contractors, right? They're the they're the green badgers, and you guys are the blue badgers, the yeah. employees. Right. Uh, I my understanding is they changed the name to paramilitary specialists rather than paramilitary ICs because they really they really are not only part of the team and not it's not like they work for Boeing, right? And then we are they're 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 not only really part of the team; they're like the essential like backbone of the team. They stay in the paramilitary mission for their entire career, whereas the PMOs, you know, we have to jump out and do O jobs and we come back um, in, a, in a way kind of like an officer corps, if you want to look at it that way. Um, but it's it, but the paramilitary specialists, they're the ones that, you know, they stay in the fight. And a lot of them, I mean, again, I, I couldn't say enough about them. Um, they're just still out there, you know, like hooking and jumping. They're really, really impressive. But. That's another avenue for a lot of folks, I think, in your audience who's like, you know, they've already done 15 years in and they just want to finish up. Hugely important, not only part of the team, but really an essential, critical part of the paramilitary mission in the agency, period. Now, you said with the, the PMOO that they will take guys, a lot of times from the special operations branches, but also from infantry um, will mm -hmm. the will that side also do that? Will they uh, the paramilitary specialists do they is that more special operations or will they take kind of people with a varied military background? It, so I think yeah, I think most of them, both on the PMO side and PM specialist side, come from special ops. Okay, there's a it's it's more of the exception rather than the norm to have you know a straight out infantry uh, guy like me. Um, but again, it was nine eleven, so they were like. Again, I'm, I'm kind of joking. They said, can you ride a horse? But they did. And of course, I lied my ass off. And I had to get shot up with like, you know, steroids to keep from swelling up. But um, it literally, you know, I had that opportunity. But at now, I mean, it's, I mean, it's super competitive to get in. I'm not saying it wasn't then. But we had to amp up considerable. Right. 
You know, we, we really, and, and I hope we never do that again. We had a, you know, in the nineties, you know, I don't know why, but they brought the, the paramilitary component way down. It happened after Vietnam and we kind of had this, um, my understanding now is that it'll never happen again. We're going to, we are funded to keep, I, I can't go into too much depth, right? I'm going to get, but they're not going to, they're own. not going to trash you guys and, and do away with you uh, and, and just right. have a skeleton crew again. Until, until a president no, that, thinks that the NSA will be able to do everything that the CIA can and guts. The bro, I think you guys are written into the U S constitution at this point. Yeah. I, I think we're, we're going to be funded at the level we need to be. And, you know, a, a very close friend of mine, is currently in charge of it. He's actually out here right now. Um, and he's very confident that he's getting everything he needs. So I, I, and so for the point of me talking about this is we still need new people, right? We have a whole generation of people that are now retiring. Um, and we're going into different areas and I know we're going to talk about it, but you know, we've been fighting the counterterrorism for 20 years and now we're going to be more involved in, uh, near peer competition, you know, fighting, or not fighting, but they're competing against China and Russia right. and the right. rogue states. Yeah, so it's it's going to be a sea change, and it's going to be some stuff that's uh, quite frankly more complicated because you know we got really comfortable fighting terrorists, but Russia is a totally different ballgame. Right, it's going to take a whole different skill set. Yeah. After uh, you finished your training, can you, you talk to us about you know prepping and preparing for Afghanistan? Yeah. So I mean, it was it was. As for all of us that remember back then, you know, it was a, you, you're going now. So, you know, you should have, you had your training, it's time to go. But we did, and then we evolved the paramilitary course. Uh, now it's really extensive. When I did it, it was a little shorter, but that was because of the circumstances. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I can't, again, I can't, now I really can't get into it specifically, but I can just speak generically. Um, most of the people that came out when we first went over, um, we worked uh, with the Northern Alliance, um, as well as all the like Fifth Special Forces group, uh, worked together to topple the Taliban and take home. It's, you know, I've just finished a paper with uh, Lieutenant General uh, Kent Tover, retired uh, 10th group, great guy. But we worked together in Iraq, but we wrote a paper, an academic paper on the importance of the CIA and, and the military soft communities working together. We always have been. And we always will be. So we need to be more deliberate and more more planned that we need to work together. But anyway, so that was a good example there in the fall of Taliban. And then we immediately went into what they called mobile teams. You know, so we're driving all over the place looking for Al Qaeda. Um, but essentially getting the lay of the land of Afghanistan because we had really zero knowledge of what was going on there. So that kind of phase was right after the fall, before the bases were set up and all of the effort that went into that. So do you have any uh, interesting insights to add from that period of time uh, after the invasion? It's a, it's kind of interesting. And I, like I, I was there in 2004, so it was before things really ramped up. It was that sort of sure. like interwar period where things were kind of stabilized. And I, I felt at least at the time we were looking at each other like, um, what are we supposed to be doing here? Yeah, no, I do remember that. And that's why I think these mobile teams kind of filled the gap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people are like, man, all we did is, you know, go to a village, ask, you know, where's Al Qaeda? And they'd say, I never heard of them. And then they'd ask for a well, and we'd be like, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> and then we'd leave the village and get ambushed. Right? <laughs> so there's a lot of people, oh, what's the point here? Uh, but I do think we did collect a lot of, of knowledge of what's going on in Afghanistan in time. And I think it essentially led to, you know, what became this really substantial network of military and, and IC bases throughout the country that I thought were very effective over the last 20 years. Um, so if you look at it all collectively, you know, there might have been some periods where we're kind of like, what the hell is going on? What are, what's the plan? But it did, it was almost a work in progress, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it did end up being pretty substantial. And I think something that all the people that were involved in it, with it should be proud of, you know, when it came to the counterterrorism effort, uh, working again with, uh, especially JSOC and the agency working together, um, super, super productive and really brought the fight to the enemy through, uh, local forces. Were there and, you know, I know we're going to get into that, but that's, that's something that I thought we could have maintained without a lot of casualties and a lot out with, without a lot of expense. 
Yeah. Were, were there growing pains with that? Because you said that, like, that 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 section was was small prior to 9-11, and then it, and then it grew. So, the, you know, so w were there growing pains? Was there rivalry competition between, like, the JSOC forces and, you know, the agency? Or even, even between the paramilitary teams, I think there's competition, wasn't there? <laughs> Well, there's always some kind of competition, and that's <laughs> right. healthy, right? That's right. just like in the services, you know. Right. Um, but to be honest, I didn't. I just didn't see it. I, I, I maybe I was so junior that you know I was just proud to be there. You know, I was just happy to be a paramilitary guy, and and I, I mean that in all seriousness. Like just being in those ranks was like the proudest thing of my life. Like if I was considered, hey, Mick was a good PM guy, I'd take it. I, I, that's good, you know. So, but I did, I was, but we were all junior guys. Like they would never put so many junior guys in charge of all these places anymore. Um, because it was, because one, they weren't many of us. Two, that's what they wanted out there. They wanted paramilitary people. So, and we didn't have a lot of people. So the natural latch up for us was with JSOC. And, and quite frankly, we were doing a lot of stuff that they weren't going to do. Because, you know, you don't use JSOC to go after the guy who's digging a ditch to put an IED in. But we did it because, right. you know, that's what we did. And they were watching us roll out every night. And finally, they were like, don't you guys need some Americans to back you up? And I was like, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> so then they got to get, you know, they, you know, it, it, we kind of did this thing where we told each other's chain of command that the other one wanted us for support. So they eventually figured that one out. But, um, it really built this strong relationship that, you know, in it totally integrated. It started, you know, with the SEALs, but it was the Rangers uh, up until we left. I mean, it would be, and again, I want to go into depth, but I'm just talking about this generally because I think it's important to know, yeah, there's some rivalry, but at the end of the day, it was also the strongest, I think, effort that we had against uh, the Taliban, against Al-Qaeda, all over, whether it was Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, uh, are all around the world. That flash up between the CIA and the military, um, I think is one of the things people will study and say, there's plenty of things they'll study and say it didn't go that well. But that one from, you know, all the efforts in Afghanistan with the forces that we work with, all the way up to the raid on a, in Abbottabad, in to, to, you know, all those things. I think that part we should, we should continue and ensure that we don't stop working together just because we don't have a war that we're in. So we don't have to restart this whole thing next time we're in another conflict. You know, you, you know, sometimes people hear stories about like the, the agents being hard to work with or the FBI being hard to work with, or, you know, there, there being these stove pipes of information. Why do you think that worked in Afghanistan with, with, you know, the, um, the paramilitary side and the military side and, and that mesh up worked? I think partly necessity, you know, before 9-11, people could be in their own stovepipe uh, and there wasn't anybody breathing down their back talking about why did all those buildings fall out. After that, people didn't want to hear excuses. They knew, okay, yeah, you don't like them. They don't like you for whatever reason. We don't care. Right. You have to protect the, the American people. Nobody cares about your inner service, inner department rivalry, right? right? So... It was that, and once you're in a close proximity and you're together, then it just naturally breaks down because, I mean, we're all the same people, Same right? guys, yeah. So, yeah, same guys. So, it, you know, there's it was both. It was necessity and it was, you know, you know, basic proximity, if you want. People just, oh, and a lot of them, especially for the PM guys, they all come from the same community. Right. So it's, yeah, and I think that that was one of the things that really, really helped uh, and then it expanded beyond Afghanistan, of course, it, all, all over the world. Uh, that relationship became critical. You're talking about the program where JSOC guys and Rangers were essentially seconded to the CIA and, and running, I, I don't want to say running, but actioning the agency's target set, if I recall correctly. So I can't go into detail on that one, but it was, it was a, let me just put it this way, it was a cooperative effort of which... Right. You couldn't even tell who was who when it came to like the assault board. You, we could tell, I mean, but it, it was one team, one fight. Let's what, put it that way. What was it that? wasn't it wasn't like we used people and then we weren't there. It was it was all together. 
uh, integrated team of uh, Americans and a, and a extensive, well-trained team of Afghans. Was that a, a uh, an economical way to make the most use of the CIA's intelligence gathering capabilities and JSOC's kicking ass capabilities, essentially? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I do think to the extent that that will be discussed publicly, and it is written about a lot, mm-hmm. so um, it is one of the most cost-effective programs that we've had. So, you know, literally dimes to dollars compared to if we used a complete U.S. military unit mm-hmm. as, as far as expense. And, of course, casualties, because a majority of the people fighting in our scenario are active. I mean, we still took a lot of casualties, both the military and the CIA, uh, as you well know. But, you know, from the point of view of being able to sustain a long-term counterinsurgency effort, one of the things you have to do, particularly if you come from a democratic society, is cut down casualties, which we all appreciate, of course, and expense. Or, and that, I mean, that was the two things that people talked about when we decided to stop this. Um, these type of programs, and that's just one of them, are one way to do that, to be able to bring the fight to the enemy for a long period of time and not sustain a lot of casualties, but actually add serious value in enabling our partner forces to be better than their mm-hmm. enemy, our common enemy, right? And I think that's to your point, Jack. I mean, yes, uh, you had some pipe hitters uh, that really brought the lethal capabilities. Of course, the PM guys have that too, but put together, it's they're pulling both you know, the intel capabilities, the strike capabilities, and quite frankly, um, you know, J- JSOC brings the Death Star. I mean, it's a cliche for a reason, right? We don't have that. Right. JSOC comes in, it's like, you know, there's... So the combination of the two, it isn't really matter like one's better than the other. It's not... A, I, I think most people I know that, that they don't think that way. They think about the capabilities of both and what we can do together. Right. And that really... I just hope it continues going forward and we don't just because, you know, we're not fighting anymore. And so we just go back to our individual buildings and and think we're doing our own thing. I hope we continue that aspect of what we did uh, in the last 20 years. Of- Mick, actually, I, 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 I just want to recommend people go back and watch our past episode with Mike Edwards, who served in the regimental reconnaissance company to hear a little bit more about what uh, my uh, what Mick is talking about tonight. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the cooperation between the PM side and the, the military side, but how was it for the PM side dealing with the like the regular agency side who was not, I imagine, used to this type of theater, this type of environment, these type these types of people really because um, mm-hmm. it, it's sort of a culture difference, right? All these guys coming in the military in in, in mass basically um, with. Mm-hmm. You know, people who up until 9-11 had been mostly doing like the embassy route, you know, the embassy tours and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, we were, we're kind of a unique species inside the agency as it is the paramilitary world. We're like, you know, part SOCOM, part agency. I think when I first started, they were going through a transition to make the paramilitary part like totally integrated into the agency. But you talk to some of the older folks and that wasn't necessarily the case. You know, now we've had a DDO who was a former, you know, paramilitary officer, ground brancher that came up through the ranks and became the deputy director of operations. So the number one person in the agency for operations. And then we have, we have PMOs that run mission centers, not just ours, which is special activity centers, uh, but also other geographic ones, right? So we're integrated. Uh, but before we were somewhat of a, who are those guys over there? Are they in the military and the agency kind of thing, right? And why are they don't wear suits? That's the other thing. They made us wear suits. All of a sudden, <laughs> one day they came in like, you're scaring the, the local, you guys got to wear suits or something. But then there was that same kind of, now, of course, the CIA and the military has always been tight. It didn't just start with my generation. Right. Always been tight. So, and, you know, the, the, the CIA itself came from OSS, which was a military organization. Right. So they had that connection. But to your point, Dave, yeah, there was before 9-11, a lot of the OOs, as we talked about, were doing traditional OO work there, which is really important and, and really impressive. But they weren't 
necessarily out in a place like Afghanistan. Some of them had been, but because of the, the necessity and the amount of people that went out there, it wasn't just PMOs or PM specialists or PM people. It was across the board. I mean, every aspect of the agency was in Afghanistan and every one of them had a big impact. So I know sometimes people focus on, you know, what, which written about in books, but you know, they're, you know, targeters, reports officers, logistics officers, all those folks had a substantial impact on what we did or didn't do in, in, and so, and I think a lot of them got very familiar, and very comfortable with the military too. By the 20 years, it, it was some of them, it was their entire career. So it wasn't like they didn't, they didn't had to relearn something. Like if you took them out now and said, well, what do you think about the military? And they're like, well, I think the military and I'm on the same team. Man. I mean, that's for 20 years they, they did this. So I think that part, there's a lot of negative stuff that came out of, make, out of Afghanistan, yeah, but that part I think is involved. Could we talk a little bit about then uh, the prep for and eventually your um, part in the invasion of Iraq? Uh, I, I did read your paper for the AEI, I think it was. Uh, yeah, MEI, Middle East. MEI. I'm a, I'm a fellow there, yeah. Yeah, um, so, um, and it, that, that was cleared by the CIA, so, and in SOCOP, because, you know, General Tobo, Ken Tobo, and I were fired. Um, and uh, you, you'll notice uh, Uncle Andy, that's the only name we used in it. Uh, some of you may know Uncle Andy, a uh, great American patriot, but it was me, him, and Ken Tobo who wrote the paper. Andy's still not allowed to. He's still working, put it that way. So those two were the primaries. Uh, well, with some other people, but the PM uh, soft leads for those Kento. I was the junior guy, um, and quite frankly, I learned I learned a lot from their leadership. And I, you know, I I told them that many a times. And that's one of the reasons why they wanted to write. Uh, a lot of the guys on the team wanted us to write a paper because there was other stuff written that was somewhat negative toward the military. It's their person's perspective. I'm not arguing with them. But our perspective where we were was the opposite. Mm-hmm. Like the, the military and the agency worked really well together. Um, and we wanted to, one, we wanted to write an academic paper. So it wasn't like, you know, no shit, there I was in hand, knee deep in hand grenade pins or anything. It's none of that. And you already know that. But it's, it's talking about what we did together in a regular warfare both against a terrorist organization, Ansar al-Islam and Operation Viking Hammer, uh, with a competent partner force, the Kurds, Peshmerga. And then we turned that against a rogue state at the time, Saddam's Iraq. Mm-hmm. And we pinned with a regular warfare uh, techniques, 14 divisions in the north using Kurds that would have opposed our, our uh, offensive from the south if we weren't up there. And, re- and in the paper, we talk about that's the kind of stuff that we need to keep doing together. We can take irregular warfare. We can compete against uh, rogue states, now Iran and North Korea. And we can well, crush and we can compete against the near peer competitors of China and Russia. And we just use that as one example. There's many. But that's what we talked about. And that's what I was part of that small team. Uh, that did that. And I was, again, it's still a junior person. We uh, uh, learned a lot. We, we interviewed Sam Faddis, uh, geez, like almost two years ago, it feels like, about uh, operation and, and going into Iraq. Could you tell us about your experience, the infiltration into country, and, and kind of your part in uh, Operation Viking Hammer and some of the other activities in northern Iraq during that time frame? So let me talk about it in general sense. Because I don't know what I'm allowed to talk about. Where I'm not. Uh, Sam Faddis is, is a friend of mine. He was a great uh, leader over there. Uh, he was a leader of the whole cabal. But, uh, there was a section in KDP area, centered in uh, Erbil, and then there was a section in the PUK, which was centered in Soleimani. Yeah. So uh, that's a group I was. So, um, in generally speaking, the idea was to have uh, composite teams. So. You had people from 10th group, people from our group, which isn't, wasn't just PM people, um, that had to go in. We did all the composition, disposition, and strength for all the Kurdish Peshmerga units because you can't love me some courage, but you can't just, you know, get this, the list that said, 
So you have 500 people, really, and 72 trucks. And, you know, you get there and you're like, where is everybody, right? <laughs> so you actually have to get on the ground and, and cause, you know, military planners need to actually know how many right. fish burger are out there, right? So we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, we did stuff like, you know, bridge and road surveys. You think, wow, that's just boring stuff. But I remember actually doing it. People were like, hey, no, they're actually going to bring military. I mean, we got to know. We actually got to know whether this bridge can hold this. It really brought a lot of stuff that we all learned and became real. Yeah. Really real. And then we did a lot of the, the initial targeting of on the green line, which was the, the line that separated the Depeche from the Saddam's um, conventional divisions, right? And then we did all of the prep work for, it was up near this place called Palabja and this Ansar al-Islam, which eventually became Al-Qaeda in Iraq and then ISIS. But they had taken over this large territory of really mountainous terrain uh, up in the northeast corner of Iraq. So that that became like the primary thing to do was to because we didn't want them on our backs when we started the invasion. So it was just a handful of Green Berets and us, a uh, handful of uh, PM uh, and a lot of Kurds, like 6,000, um, that fought straight up significant mountains for weeks. So it was it was uh, like old school um, PM SF stuff. Uh, and it was, you know, and God bless the Kurds. I mean, we, we played our part. You know, we were there to enable, we were out there fighting right next to them. But the Kurds, uh, as you, I'm sure know, super brave. And the only bad part is it was right up against Iran. So a lot of the senior leadership just scooted into Iran and left their, you know, mopes to die, as they usually do. Uh, and they did. They fought, they fought hard. And, uh, and we ended up clearing that whole area. And at least it took that, that sizable and significant threat from the, and then we had to turn everybody and get them on the green line uh, before the invasion, right? And that was, I mean, they, they literally had, I mean, we didn't know how they were going to get from A to B, and we were trying to plan it for them, and then he just kept telling us, don't worry about it. And then one day, I'm telling you, tractors, taxis, buses, all pulled up, and these guys just got on it and went, went to the sound of the drums, man. And we're like, okay, you guys had to figure it out the whole time. And then they, they in if Saddam would have been smart, he would have done Operation Viking Hammer to push straight in to northern Iraq because there was essentially nothing that would have uh, resisted it because everybody, at least in our area, was up in the, in the Viking Hammer, is what the U.S. name for that was, uh, and not on the line. But they didn't, and, and we got the got the Pesh back down on the green line. And, and I mean, just for the audience, obviously, and correct me if uh, or, or add to if you have anything you'd like to say, Mick, but I mean, it, the basic premise of it was, you know, we're invading Iraq from the south and the north and pushing on both sides. Um, and, and also Ansar al-Sharia could have become a threat that likewise could have been pushing down south on our forces as we invaded if we didn't have Mick and 10th Group and those other guys out there dealing with that threat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Jack. They had... We were supposed to have fourth infantry division in there. I don't know if you remember this part of history. There's a lot going on. But Turkey and then, wouldn't, yeah. And Turkey wouldn't let them in. I mean, I remember that when we had a, again, I shouldn't be telling specific stories, but Come this on. is a fact and everybody knows it. We had to go to them and say, hey, uh, Turks won't let fourth infantry division. So you basically got us. And it was just a handful of us. And they're like, can you get more ammo? <laughs> like, that we can do. Because we were, we were really kind of, Wondering where they they go. You got to be kidding me now. So we're fighting, we're fighting fourteen because you know the Kurds are a militia. I mean, it's high let's drive in, you know, and right. we're going up against tanks, armored personnel, carry artillery, air, helicopters, um, and the Kurds were like, okay, we're going to need a lot more guns, a lot more ammunition. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's 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 a reasonable request. But you know, we did get some conventional elements in there, and I think that was good. But you know, I mean. Turkey being our NATO ally, you know, quite frankly, I would have expected a little more than, you know, not allowing our, I mean, you, they could have disagreed with the war in Iraq. A lot of people did, but you know, when it comes down to it, your NATO ally is already going to war and you won't even let, you know, let, let their forces go through your territory. Right. I mean, that's, 
That's yeah, S- Sam had some pretty gnarly stories about how the Turks made him take like um, some Turkish liaisons into Soleimania. And if you know anything about the politics of the area, the PUK Kurds do not get along very well with the Turks, and it's just like crazy. And then when he when he had to go back through Turkey to get out, they they would like call him into the office, and these Turks would just like chastise him and tell him how horrible they all are. And I mean, it just sounded like politically, it sounded like a mess. Yeah, and. You know, I mean, there's a lot. Turkey's important for a lot of reasons. So if I'm talking strategic, but talking as a, just a regular guy, as a paramilitary guy, we never would have done that to them, right? I mean, we never would have taken, you know, a, a junior guy and berated them because of the policy of their country. We just right. wouldn't have done it. Right. We just should have been like, hey, man, you, me, same, same. We're in here. Right. We're both soldiers, whatever you want to say. Uh, we... But yeah, I, ne- I never did understand why they would take a GS-11 and berate him for the policy of the president. Right, right. Like, hey man, I just work here kind of thing. And I, you know, that kind of, that did kind of irritate me and it obviously irritated a lot of people. Uh, uh, but again, Turkey's uh, very important. I think, you know, it's a broader issue, but they're pulling further and further away mm-hmm. from the yeah. West and yeah. they are a key, obviously, I've always been a key uh part of uh, the geostrategic terrain, as you would. So we need to do a lot more to try to keep that in, in our sphere, I think. But yeah, I, I think you can talk to most of the people up there and they became, well, it, it irritated them the way that we were treated. Yeah. That way. And of course, and I'm sure you guys either are or know people, became very close to the Kurds because uh, those folks you can trust in a fight and hole, you know. Right. And and so that that connection, I think, will last forever, at least with our generation. So the the invasion happens. You're there for all that, but then you were also there for the the insurgency and the kind of rising up of, of this Iraqi insurgency. Uh, can you tell us about what what that was like from you know the the paramilitary perspective? Yeah. So I think I think it caught a lot of people. Not necessarily off guard, but it was kind of like you mentioned in Afghanistan where people, we, you know, the sound fell, the statue fell, and people were like, okay, well, that wasn't too hard. Um, and then there was, I think, a surprising lack of a plan, you know, looking back at it. Mm-hmm. And then we made some key strategic mistakes. I know people will say it a lot, but it's, you know, the idea that we'd disband the army, uh, which would essentially put all these very well trained people on the street with no prospect of a job. It was a terrible idea. Uh, and then, you know, telling everybody that was the, you know, part of Saddam's, when you had to, even if you were a second grade teacher, you had to be part of that right. political establishment and you wouldn't be a teacher. Right. So I, I know that's, that drum's been beaten a lot, but I think that was a substantial factor in the insurgency. So to go to your question, Zach, that, I think, you know, looking back at it, that was not helpful. We should have, we should have understood that the military could have been the opposite of uh, counter, you know, they could have actually helped keep the insurgency from happening. Right. Uh, instead of they became part of it, you know, especially the Sunni part of the military. Yeah. Uh, and, and now they're, uh, you know, we've been dealing with that problem ever since. I think there was a lot of stuff that we did right, which was um, really working with the natural pushback at Al Qaeda in Iraq, which was totally brutal. Uh, brutal to the point where bin Laden was even chastising them. Uh, it really, inside the Sunni uh, community, had this huge pushback, and we kind of supported that. It, it was a real thing. It was a real issue. And I think that to the extent that the surge was successful there, um, that was probably it. Because instead of us going in and superimposing what we think should happen, we realized this is an organic pushback against a not only a terrorist organization, a terrorist organization that was brutalizing the people they were claiming to be for. And then I think working together, uh, we saw a success. There's going to be ups and downs. And obviously when we pulled out um, ent- entirely, that led to the rise of ISIS, which I'm concerned is what the same bad decision we just made in Afghanistan. We saw it play out when we pulled out. We saw the fall of the Iraqi military. Also a military who tried to build mirror image as us, mm-hmm. uh, also fall to a militant group full of people with, you know, machine guns and highlights mm-hmm. and ISIS. 
And then we had to create this 80 nation coalition, develop another substantial partner force in the SDF with uh, the Kurdish uh, leadership. And, you know, we had to fight, you know, quite a long time to get to liberate what was an area the size of West Virginia, uh, millions of people. So that is what happened when, in Iraq when we decided that we had enough and just didn't want to be there anymore. I'm concerned that's already happened, quite frankly, in Afghanistan within, you know, before we even left, uh-huh. we already had the Taliban take back over and uh, terrorist organization kind of run free. So... But in, in regards to the, the insurgency in Iraq and the, the rise of AQI, I mean, how how did you guys handle that on the PMOO side? Was it, was it that continued relationship with JSOC that you had in Iraq? Um, or was it more intelligence-driven? So it was both. Um, if you remember, that's when uh, General McChrystal was JSOC commander, right? So they... And it, you know, it happened not just when he was JSOC commander, but I think he deserves a lot of credit. That they just fine tuned the fine fix finish, you know, that and the agency was a huge part of that. And obviously JSOC led it. And then we had, we, you know, I, I don't want to get into the stuff we did there because I'm not allowed to, but we had a very similar type of program and a very effective program. And it did work hand in glove with the military. Um, and then plus the, the JSOC broader effort to really target, um, we did, I mean, we definitely learned that as a, as a community, how to find terrorists, figure out when they're going to be there, either finish them with a partner force unilaterally, um, or obviously with, with, uh, air assets. Uh, we got really good at that. And I think that's something that we're probably going to need to continue, especially now that we're not on the ground. Um, but it's only one part of the puzzle, right? It's a much broader issue. Terrorists, you know, you think about it. Okay, so that's been successful, but ISIS started in Iraq and now it's in 28 countries. Right. Right. So you got to also be, be fair in your self assessment and say, well, we're obviously not doing everything right. Um, because the problem has seemed to expand into every parts of the globe and in countries that never had this issue before. Now it's expanding in Africa right across the Sahel. Uh, a lot of the stuff from East Africa is just going into Central Africa and basically being West Africa. And it's all right. the way up. And it's, it's a substantial thing that we don't really think about as a country until something, something right. happens. This was also, correct me if I'm wrong, the time frame where targeting officers became a thing in the agency as well. Right. So I wasn't, they, they didn't exist when I joined. Um, but I think exactly to your point, they came around because of this global war on terror. I think they do a lot more than CT work now, but that's probably where they really made their made their stripes or got their stripes. And they became essential, absolutely essential. They'll never go away. We'll always have targeters now. Uh, it's not just for, you know, the the actual CT target, fine, fix, that kind of stuff, but it's, it's also, you know, it, in every aspect of intelligence collection. So how do we get near uh, a person we're interested in? To recruit them, you know, not just not just to, you know, to finish them. So the, I think that that skill set, that's another skill set that some of your audience might want to look at. Uh, it's super um, important, and a lot of the people that are very technically savvy do really well on that. It's it's kind of you, you got to have the mind that can play four dimensional chess, but if you do, you can be exceptional as a target, and you can have a big impact. What? How do you? I mean, I know that wasn't your area, but do you know how that evolution happened? Do you, do you know, were there just people who kind of started doing that and then it became their thing? Or did somebody identify a vacuum and say, we need people doing this? I think, and maybe you can have somebody on that knows more specifically, but from my, my memory, a lot of people started doing a job of a targeter that were um, like desk officers people like that or analysts uh-huh. and then they realized oh this is this is actually super important to the point where we need to make it you know our version of an MOS right, right? so and then they then they have their own training and and now they have their own specialty but I but if I recall a lot of analysts were doing that at first and a lot of other DO people mm-hmm. filling that that role and now we have it as a full-fledged skill set 
I, I I hope I'm not speaking out of turn when I say this, but you remember we had we had Mark Polymeropoulos on here. Uh, he's talking about yeah. during the invasion, and he was he was a uh, operations officer going on target with uh, SEAL Team Six. <laughs> so I imagine maybe they wanted something more formal at a certain point. Yeah, and Mark is a really good friend of mine, and uh, we actually were both chiefs of base at the same place. Oh, we cool! Did turnovers together. Yeah, he's he's a great. He was a great leader, OO, and he's doing great work now. I mean, as you know, he had that. TBI from uh, the sonic weapons of the Russian, um, but just a super great guy. And he is a good example of, like, to your point, when you were asking about O's, he's an OO, but he served in a lot of rough places and did a lot of rough missions. Uh, and he wasn't the only OO that did that. I mean, we had a lot of OOs with us all over the place. So if, if you want to do something that is service, I think service is like any other person serving in the military, and maybe you haven't been in the military. Being an OO is definitely an option, right? So you can you can uh, you can come from different backgrounds. You can be a business background, can, uh, a lot of different things, and, and, and look at that. And Mark was a great example of uh, one that had a huge impact. And, and just for people again who might be looking at you know the the CIA as a career, can you can you kind of dif- differentiate like how a targeter differentiate or how a targeter differs from an analyst and maybe what kind of person might be attracted to each type of thing? Yeah. So an analyst, um, their people, as, as, as the name implies, they take a lot of information that's collected by people in the DO and they synthesize it together and then they, they develop a product that goes to policymakers. Just like my last job or it was out of when I, after, after I retired, I was up. It was in the policy community. And so that is supposed to be the basis, the factual basis of which we discuss and make policy. You're not supposed to just make up your own facts. It's supposed to come from finished products, and those are products that are done by analysts. So they take collection from human signals, all sorts of intelligence, and then they try to make sense of the world based on their depth and depth knowledge. So a lot of them are masters and PhDs in their certain areas. Targeters are in the DO. So they're people, a lot of them come from the military, but you don't have to. They are people that come in and um, they teach them to use all the systems available out there that, that can, can help them identify a person that we're interested in. Again, it's not all CT. Like we also, I mean, Russia and China are very high, as you'd expect, just like they are in our national security strategy. They're very high on the intelligence list. Uh, so, who do we need to know? Who, who would have the most information? And who, how do we get near them? Targeters do that too. So they're, they're, they're across the spectrum of what we do, what they do in the CIA. So, and, and again, like you already pointed out, that was, that's a new MOS, or you don't call them MOSs, but you get the point, the specialties. Um, just like an OO, uh, there's a CMO, and that's used to be called a reports officer. It's a case management officer. And they're kind of half analyst and half operator. They do a lot to, to, to know what the community needs and then to help task the OOs to make sure that they go get that piece of information so that they can write that final product that they feel like they have the fidelity to tell, you know, all the way up to the president, this is what we think about the Iranian nuclear program. For right. And then we have a staff operations officer, used to be called a desk officer, and they, they're more on the op side and they kind of manage a lot of, uh, uh, what what we do when it comes to asset handling. And I'm repeating a lot what's on the recruiting website, so don't feel like I'm giving it. No, yeah. Because, yeah. It, it's, but a lot of people might not. Yeah. You know, I think people appreciate go to that hearing one part. this. Yeah. yeah. I, so there's a lot of, yeah. You know, go, go ahead, please finish. No, I was just going to say, there's a lot of uh, um, specialties and skills in the DO and the D in the CIA or at large. There's also a whole technical section too, right? Um, that almost anybody can find something they want to do there. It's a small group, and it's kind of surprising when you get into know how small it is. But you can, because it's small, you can have a big impact. Right. Like one person can have a big impact, and I think that's what if people that really want that. But it's also you know you don't get parades for the agency, right? You, you don't you don't get on the plane first, right? They don't they don't ever say, hey, if you serve in the CIA, you get to get on the plane. First. Right, I mean, right. They don't. Not that that's a big deal, right? Right. But it's 
there's nothing. Nobody's coming up to going, thanks for your service or anything like that. So, uh, and that's okay because that's just part of the deal. So you, you but I, and I bring that up because you got to know if you're going in there, it's not about that. Right. And, you know, it's not about that for military people too, because I'm a military person and you all too. Right. But it, you really isn't about that because it's not going to happen. Right. So you have to be willing to accept, you know, total in the shadows, your service. Uh, a lot of us retire overt now because we retire pretty young. But in the old days, they didn't even retire overt. They right. just stayed in the shadow. And, yeah. you know, I know a lot of the old guys and you can't even get them to talk now. Yeah. And then they know I'm in their old unit. Yeah. They're like, man, who are you hiding from? You know, I'm, but yeah. you know, that was the, that was the culture, but it's still part of the culture. You have to be willing to, it's, it is service in the shadows and that's where, you know, most of it will be. Yeah. Mick, I want to ask you about the bin Laden raid, but first I want to take uh, a minute here to talk about our sponsors. Of we got to thank our sponsors. Thank you for, yeah. you know, buying us Lafroig and, and keeping our lights on. Our first one is manscaped.com. They are a male grooming company. And uh, they sell the lawnmower 4.0 for some of that uh, grooming needs you may have down south. And if you use our promo code Team20, you get 20% off your first order and free shipping. And and it's it's a good product. I, Meg, are you into male grooming, like the nether regions? Because I'm, I'm not. Because I'm going to say like I'm in Montana, so even if I was and I said it, I'd probably be asked to leave. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so we'll we'll just we'll we'll uh we'll just say that hasn't been cleared by the Montana uh, PBR uh, or uh, PRB. I mean, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, these are good products. So the the lawnmower, uh, it's you know has like that that ceramic edge so that you don't nick. Because if you've ever tried to do it with your regular hair it's trimmers, dicey. it's dicey. It's dicey. It's dicey. Um, and it's got a nice little LED light on there to let you know what's going on down there. Yeah. Uh, check out your stuff. But so, uh, yeah, yeah, check you, out Manscaped. You don't want to earn a purple heart while you're doing some uh, male grooming. No, definitely not. So our second sponsor tonight is Bluebird Botanicals. They are a CBD company. They uh, make CBD oil. There is a lotion. There is a, a chapstick. Uh, what else is there that I'm, that I'm missing? They, they have a number of different CBD products. And they uh, help you. I mean, I've used the oil. It helps me sleep at night. Uh, the cream is really good for your aches and pains. I use the cream for my arthritis, and it really helps. It's a menthol cream with a full-spectrum CBD in it. It's really nice. And the website is bluebirdbotanicals.com. If you go there now, you can use the promo code TEAM50 and get 50% off your purchase site-wide. Yeah, and if anybody out there, especially any veterans, uh, if you're having challenges sleeping at night or anything else like that and you're maybe using a little of this try it's, a, it's try bluebird try it, it try, does it does work and uh, cbd and bluebird is a high quality cbd oil it's a full spectrum uh a lot of the stuff that you can buy in shops around you are not full spectrum and you don't you actually don't get the effect of the cbd so give them a try all right Back to our regularly scheduled program. Oh, Thank I want to give a shout out too. I was at Comic Con yesterday, and there's a there's a um, a, uh, a charity there called Stack Up, uh, StackUp.org, and they're not paying us. They're not doing anything. I just saw them, uh, and what they do is they have a lot of programs for veterans and for active military. Um, with veterans, they use gaming to try to help uh, veterans reintegrate into society, which is actually. Why we why we have this studio because we originally tried that too, but apparently they're doing it successfully. Um, they also uh, send you know gaming packs, uh, playstations, whatnot to troops overseas. And if you've ever been overseas, you know you need game systems. Um, and they also have an Overwatch program, which is a Discord channel and other resources. Uh, to help you, uh, to help any veterans who may be going through a tough time. And I think we all go through tough times every now and again. So um, you, there's always somebody available. Uh, you can check out their Discord. Go to uh, stackup.org to check them out. And uh, if you got a few spare pennies, uh, send them their and, way also. And, and actually, while we're on that topic, before we get back into the interview, Mick, you were, you're also involved with some charity uh, events. Um, do you want to talk about that yeah, at all? Sure. So 
Um, my partner and I, my business partner here at Lobo Institute, we, uh, I don't want to, because I can go on forever, but we did a documentary on a child soldier. Um, it, we're, we're not documentary makers. We just did it kind of a, because he was a friend of ours and his story was just incredible. And so was his wife, uh, who was also a child soldier. And then they, it started getting used to raise money for the, to, for the charities that did, uh, that stuff and like try to end the use of children as soldiers. And then from that, we became part of many boards in, in Africa to help that. And we created our own, uh, NGO that's global called End Child Soldiering. So it is, uh, it's in the process of getting its 501c3. It, the entire purpose of it is to find those groups that, you know, quite frankly, are in the bush helping kids. They don't have an opportunity to raise money. They're doing the right thing. So our NGO takes the money and gives it to those people that we already know are doing good things. And and we, nobody takes a salary from the in child soldiering. It's all going to them. Uh, and we account for all of it, right? So um, that is our, that is our NGO, but there's a lot out there. So we're just, we're, we're a small one and new. Uh, there's also, if you guys remember, uh, Hotel Rwanda, Romeo mm -hmm. Dallaire, he's got a big group. Uh, but it's a huge issue and it's growing all over the world. And anybody that's fought in a lot of these places knows it because they've seen kids get on the battlefield. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, it, for both me and Eric, it's just one of those things that's, some basically intolerable. Yeah. Right. If those want to start wars, they got to fight them. Yeah. They shouldn't go get a twelve year old to fight them for them. Right. Right. So, and it's it's just despicable. So, um, we need to stop it. We need to hold allies and enemies, and allies and enemies accountable for what they do, uh, and not give waivers because the United States has a lot of strong laws against uh, the use of children as soldiers, and we need to hold people accountable. And then the folks that have been forced to fight need to be rehabilitated so they have some right. kind of chance of life. Is there, One, is because there, it's your, yeah. I was going to ask, is there generally, I mean, because a lot of those kids grow up in that system, and that's just sort of who they become, even when they become young adults. Is there sort of, obviously, within those countries, it's probably tough, but is there no sort of international s sense of forgiveness and understanding that they grew up in a, in a, in a way that was totally beyond their control and they've been indoctrinated um by, you know into the this system are do do countries try to help them or do they just hold them you're an adult now and you're fully accountable for what you do so there is I, there is definitely a belief that a child who's forced to fight uh is not ultimately responsible for that there is, I think, to be fair, and it's, it is fair that once they become an adult, they have an opportunity not to do it if they right. continue on. Right. And they're committing. Okay. And they're committing war crimes and they're responsible for it. But so it's, it's not an easy answer. And I think that's a really, uh, legitimate question. But as a society, we've seen in the UN stats, and we wrote a couple of papers on this, the UN saw, uh, the use of children as soldiers in the Middle East double in 2019. So it's, it's going in the act exactly the opposite direction. As you well know, weapons get lighter, yeah, more lethal. You can be smaller and carry them. Kids are cheap. They don't eat much. They do what the adults tell them to. Uh, and they become this like this perfectly horrible weapon. Yeah. Um, and, and they, and once they believe that they have no way out, and that's what a lot of these do, right. they tell them, Hey, they make them, they make them do horrible acts. Right. It's not even militarily viable because they want them to believe I am no longer a person. I'll never be accepted back in my village, my society. Yeah, yeah. I have no Bob, other lot in life. Yeah. Bob Adolf told us that when he was uh, in Sierra Leone, that like the first thing they would do is make the kids rape the old woman in the village so that they can never, ever return. They know this is a one way yeah. trip. You're never going back. Right. And that's, you know, we, we worked a lot, uh, both Eric and I in the counter LRA mission, which was, uh, called observant compass for the military name for it and that is one of the armies that it was almost entirely at one time made up of children like lots of militias are like some children uh this was you know almost entirely children because they couldn't get any more adults to fight so they just went and grabbed all the kids and they made them do horrible things just like you just described and they felt like they couldn't go go back so a lot of these groups that we work with and it's all done within the village and the society. Like 
we get the village to understand, like, these kids, they, they're your kids, and they didn't have a choice. And they were kidnapped as, as very young, both men and, I mean, girls and boys, I should say. And then they already have a way to accept people who made mistakes back in the village. So we help them, we, the groups that we work with, uh, help them do that with these kids. And then they come back and they learn how to either farm or raise livestock, you know, stuff that they can actually do in the, in the areas and then become productive members of society and forgive themselves. I mean, yeah. That's, yeah. that's one of the hardest parts is so, getting them to forgive themselves. So guys, uh, check out Lobo Institute.org org, L O B O like a wolf Lobo Institute.org. And there's a tab, um, on that page that leads you to the end child soldiering um, page uh, and you can donate, you can volunteer, right? Uh, or one of the, uh, the, okay, donate right now. Yeah, you can donate. You can also, you can also become involved. I mean, if okay. you, you're more of a person that wants to become involved, we'll be glad to talk to you about that. Uh, there's a lot of groups out there um, that are doing good stuff. And it's, it's one of those, I mean, think about it. So child soldiers are generally in a very impoverished society and they're, right. the, they're the poorest. So like, there's nobody that cares about these kids. There just isn't. It's sad to say, but it just, they're just not. Right. And, and then of course you got the people who go, well, they're, aren't they, didn't they kill a lot of people? You know, so then you got that too. It's not, the, it's, they're not necessarily sympathetic. I think it's the right thing to do, but it's also the right thing to do for us. Because if, if you take what's going on in Syria right now, like take El Hall, uh, refugee camp. It's about seventy thousand people. Most of them are women and kids. Mm. Like if we don't get to them, these mm. like the cubs of the caliphate or whatever ISIS called them, they're the next ISIS. So it actually there's actually behooves us to come up with some other alternative for these kids other than that. You know, even if it's just learn a trade in stay in Syria or Iraq. Yeah, they're, well, they're going to become ISIS. Sorry, I, but not to mention the absolute toll it would take on on a on a Western mo- mentality to 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 fight children. Like we think we have yeah. the veterans, you know, are, are have some challenges right now. That I can't even imagine the burden uh, that that you know you would face having that as your only option you know going uh yeah. get, getting back from the the heyday of the iraq insurgency uh one of the other things was the the bin laden raid pushing forward and i i, I don't know what it was that you wanted to touch upon there but I, i'm certainly interested i'd definitely like to hear your perspective if you had any insights about the the run-up to the raid and, and how it went down so I don't want to talk about the sense that I knew stuff, you know, that I'm not supposed to talk about. I know I say that a lot, but, you know, I think, and, and quite frankly, in that rate, everything came out anyway, right? It was, that was one thing, you know, next time we do something like this, don't talk about it so much. You know, we actually exposed a lot of real, real important uh, capabilities. But I would say this, um, I don't think it was uh, a, a coincidence that, he was found essentially in the West Point of Pakistan. Uh, I don't think it was a surprise to the Pakistani, Pakistani intelligence service that he was there at all. Uh, and it looks like, to me, this is just mixed speaking, um, they wanted to keep him there because they thought they were benefiting from, you know, our, our funding of the combined war on terrorism, quite frankly. Uh, I do think it's a great example of the military and the agency working together, both the finding of that, uh, a finding of the, the career that led to the, the, the house, the compound, and then all the effort that went in to, to determine whether that was actually him, you know, not just, you know, a tall Arab, but all the other stuff that went into that. I think it's a great example of uh, intelligence military cooperation. Mm-hmm. One of the yeah. things that came out in the press uh, about the raid was that, you know, multiple p- different plans were looked at. Um, one of them was potentially using, uh, obviously, they, they utilized the agency's Title 50 covert action authorities. But there is some talk from what I read that they they were considering using actual agency assets that they would have utilized like Ground Branch to go in and execute this mission. I was wondering if from your perspective, you had any visibility on that and what you thought about the decision being made there. So generally speaking, the way 
the agency's paramilitary teams work, they don't function as an entire squadron. Mm-hmm. Right? We usually are very small teams. Not usually. We're always a very small team. And we work with indigenous uh, troops to be able to bring that more of that, that offensive power to a target. Uh, but we don't function like JSOC. That brings, they have a whole squadron that does nothing but train together. Mm-hmm. So whether it was the Abbottabad raid or the next one, uh, or Baghdadi or whoever, um, I think we work best when we stay in the lanes that we are trained to do. Right. So I know some people will have a rivalry and say, yes, we could have like collected every paramilitary guy. You know, what, what I would say is it, in, you know, paramilitary guys played an important role in that. And a lot of that was the collection in a very difficult environment to be able to determine that was the combat. Um, and I think that's the role we should have played. But we have uh, top tier units in JSOC, you know, whether it's Delta or Dev Group that do this together as in my, my, my business partner was the squadron commander uh, from Dev Group. So, I mean, that's what they do. And so I know some people might disagree with me in my old tribe, but I think that, and I actually don't think a lot of people would disagree with me in my old tribe, but um, I think that's the way we should do business. We have units uh, in the military that specialize in this type of thing, and they're the most effective. They're not just starting from scratch, training together. They've been, they've been, that unit has been doing stuff for 20 years as right. a unit in that capacity. So for a lot of those guys, and, and I know you know, and I know a lot of them, that was just another, 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 you know, it was a big one. And I was, I was out on a, a very remote base on the border of Pakistan. So I waited up all night and, you know, I was also the guy that once we actually saw that it was successful staring at it, going, I can't believe it. Like, yeah. You know, and it, so, um, hugely successful mission. I know we lost the helicopter. I think that was a mistake to use something that we had not trained on. Um, before that, but you know, okay, it's easy to, to kind of armchair quarterback now. But to your point, Jack, I think what we ought to do, and I saw this, and I think you probably saw it a lot, is like when the, the war kicked off, it seemed like everybody else wanted to do everybody else's job. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey man, you're really cool. Your unit does really cool stuff. Do what it does. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like all the all the folks that are supposed to be working with indigenous forces wanted to become their own assault forces, and then the assault forces wanted to be spies and spies wanted to be here and i think we ended up in the right place but you know it takes everything right and you know to be blunt intel and soft has played a huge part in the last 20 years but you know what if we go to war against china it's going to be infantry divisions right it's going to be aircraft carriers and we're going to play a part but you know it's not going to be the the soft uh, cia show right. uh, we're going to play a part um, so, but we got to keep in mind, like we all have a purpose, you know, whether you're uh, the, you know, the army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, whether you're conventional, unconventional, um, you never know what's going to be the most important thing at the time. Right. right? So everybody, it's, nobody's cooler than anybody else. You have a job, do your job. And so I would say, you know, it's a, it's a more extended answer to your question, Jack, but I do think that that is the way we should look at things. We have units that are mm-hmm. that, that, that do things. Uh, also, from Title 10 and Title 50, people always, a lot of people say, well, I will get credit if I'm under Title 50. Yeah, you will, man. It's, it's, it's just one more tool in the USG toolbox. And the public right? doesn't even so, know the difference anyway. They don't know. They don't care. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a way that we can we can say, I don't know what happened, man. We didn't do it. Must have stepped on a landmine. You know, whatever. Whatever, bro. Um, yeah, it's part. It's just one tool in the national security toolbox, and the military and the agency, you know, they all have their place. Nick, you brought up a really interesting point because you said that like these guys have been working together or doing this for twenty years, and you know, you said that like these PM group, you know, this PM group grew pretty rapidly. What happens when you put? a SEAL and a Green Beret and a Delta Force guy and, um, you know, a, a MARSOC guy or a Ranger on a team with no real established TTP because everybody has a different way of doing things. Um, what was that sort of growth process like for for the agency, for the guys in the agency? So I think that's the primary purpose of the PM course. Remember we were talking about that earlier and I said it's not really like a, 
you know, let's try to get rid of all these guys. It's mostly to put everybody on the same sheet of music of how we do. And it, and it, and of course it draws a little bit from each one of the groups you just mentioned. Uh, but then we also have our own way of doing it. I do think, yes, there are certain stereotypes of each one of the group. And there's also like, there's some groups do some things better than others and others, you know, I think the fusion, uh, really makes it really effective. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that a lot from people who spend a lot of time in the PM community that even though they might be a little more partial to their background, that they would say, yeah, but having a different perspective on my team really makes the team better. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that's the case. And we do now have a very extensive uh, training program that seeks to make sure everybody is on the same, literally on the same sheet um, in the way we do it as a, a community. Do you, do you guys, after spending so much time in the military and, and probably having a lot of time in combat, do you, I mean, obviously people come in and, and every, you know, guys in the special operations community tend to, you know, we all tend to think that our way is the way. Um, do, are there, do you guys tend to like, oh, well, that's not how you do it. This is how you do it. I mean, or, or do people generally kind of get on board with, are they, are they flexible generally? I think early on we saw a lot of the, that's not how you do it. This is the way we do it. And then, and then, you know, it's because it, we just kind of thrust together. Right. Right. And a lot, and, you know, quite frankly, when we all started, none of us knew whether we were right or wrong anyway, because right. we hadn't done anything. Right. You know, the, the real test is, is, you know, combat. Right. Right. But then I think, I think where we ended up is, is a, a compilation of what worked plus the best aspects of the community people came from. And of course, those communities were evolving the whole time too. Right. Because they, right. I mean, they were like, hey, this doesn't actually work. It might be in a training manual, but it doesn't work. Or this does work. So I think, I think it was more like a collective uh, effort to make sure we got to the right place. And, you know, I, I'm, I've been retired for four years, but um, actually more than four years, right? So yeah, anyway, but they, they, uh, they keep changing, they keep evolving. Yeah. So that, that training course that we have is way different than the one that I had when I went through. So the guys that you might be in your audience now that are coming in and they actually, it, unlike a lot of it, they take a lot on board from the people that go through the course, right? Because these aren't spring chickens, you know, right. these are the sergeant major from, you know, fifth special forces group. He's, they, they're just as much a part of the, the training as the instructors, right? Right. So it's an unusual course. Um, because they realize, hey, they got a lot of experience. It's coming to bus boy. They hired, right? So they're not just going to say, hey, sit there, shut up, and listen to what you tell you. Yeah. They they really involve uh, the students, if you will, the guys that are going through this course, uh, develop it. That's and, great. And, 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 yeah. I yeah. want to hit some uh, yeah, let's, yeah, let's viewer some questions point. here, uh, Jackson. I, I think we answered all of your questions there. Um, let's see. Uh, just how much leeway is there within the special activity center as a PMOO for mission types? Are there guys there who do FID, UW, whereas others specialize in direct action? Sort of answered that, but what, what do you want to say about that, Mick? So there is no, I guess everybody in this sense, when it comes to the irregular warfare genre of activities, there's, there's really no specialist. We are all generalists when it comes to that, right? So, where it's unconventional warfare, working with the ninjas force, whether it's, um, well, there's also a whole influence part um, that's super important. It probably doesn't get enough attention. But it, on the PM side, um, now you got guys that are just naturally better at the intelligence part. And you got guys that are naturally intelligent at the direct action stuff. Um, so th there is a part of that that does occur. We have people that, in our PM specialists are the guys that really have the hard skills, right? So we have all that, like, just like you'd see in, in military soft, you have, you know, your jump team, your dive, your mountain warfare, all that kind of stuff. And those guys really carry that skill set in the way we utilize. Uh, but, but for the most part, uh, PM OOs are generalists and they, and they are expected to be able to, you know, go out with and plan an operation with an indigenous force and then, you know, the next year be in an embassy at a cocktail party talking to a nuclear scientist and, and actually making sense, right, you know, right. you know not, not expected to be a nuclear scientist, but you can actually talk to one and actually 
keep the guy's interest. Right. Here uh, is uh, this is kind of an interesting one that you touched on a little <clears> bit. What's the day-to-day life uh, like for a ground branch operator in the United States compared to you know other elite units that you might find like in the military? So uh, uh, in the United States, I mean, we uh, the CIA is precluded legally from working in the United States. We do we do assist you know the FBI, etc. But that's not really that's not a PM mission. So everything we do is out overseas, um, and that's a lot of it's in the conflict areas. Uh, and a lot of it's in areas that, you know, we're not really in a conflict, but we have folks there. And then we also do, you know, our bread and butter is to collect information intel in austere environments. Mm-hmm. So it's not all action stuff, but you have, you have to have that skill to be able to survive in places like Juba, South Sudan, or, you know, Zamboanga, Philippines, um, to be down there and do our job as intelligence collectors, but also in areas where even the CT threat's high or the criminal threat's high. Or, and so there's a lot of that too. And a lot of places just kind of suck. And, you know, we're, we tend to be the people that are just used to it, you know? Um, so there's, there's, and, and, you know, I think it's important to point out, it's not all, it's not all, uh, you know, exciting necessarily. A lot of it's mundane. You're, you're in the middle of the night, some, third world city trying to meet a guy in an alley and you know you're gonna get screamed at when you get home because you you know the fifth night out in a row i mean there's a lot of that kind of stuff not scream that oh i appreciate that <laughs> you might not you're, you're right what wife not, might not appreciate you as much as she could uh because you're constantly gone so there's and it's important i, I don't want to uh sugarcoat this stuff you do spend a lot of time away from your family just like you do in the military um, you do as well here. And, you know, um, we, we, we host a lot of retreats where I am in Montana, uh, uh, from gold star families, uh, a lot of the military, including my own unit. And I bring that up because it's, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't point out, you know, we lost a lot of people. We lost a lot. We got a lot of guys seriously injured. Um, it's, it, it's, and I don't, it's not something that recruiters usually bring up. I'm not a recruiter, but we all are in a sense. But I think it's absolutely imperative mm-hmm. because you don't want people not knowing that. You know, I've, I have four goddaughters. They're all gold star daughters. They're here right now. And I'm not unusual. Uh, and I know this is the same with the military, but some of your folks that, you, that are in your audience might not be in the military. Maybe they're looking to, to do this. And I hope we don't have this level of casualties uh, now, but you can't, you can't just talk about the cool stuff and not talk about the stuff that, lingers forever with right. everybody that's been in the unit that we've been in, involved in. Stuart says, Mick, really proud of what you and Eric are doing with the Lobo Institute, brother. Keep it up, Stu. Uh, Jackson oh. says, can you explain the background of the pick where you are on the title screen and the significance of the patch you are wearing with the skull and dagger? Also, first, thanks, Stu. Um, what picture is he talking about? I, I guess the picture the you sent me where you're overseas. Oh, yeah. I wanted to give you something different than my normal tie and policy dude. Oh, I can't talk about the patch and all that stuff. <laughs> so, um, it, I mean, uh, I will say this in general terms. We become very much a part of the units that we're, uh, we work with. You know, we, you know, the indigenous units where we are. Um, you, and, and it's not just us. I mean, you can see this in the in the whole effort to get all these Afghans out of Afghanistan. I mean, that was a that was a pretty traumatic experience for a lot of my friends and a lot of your friends. I know it was like, hey, these are my. I gave my word to this guy. This guy saved my life. This mm-hmm. guy fought alongside me. He's no different than the guy uh, that I know that's now you know that's an American. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I'm I'm answering the question in the sense that we're part of that union. I mean, yes, we're six inches taller and 40 pounds heavier and white with red, red beards, but uh, we are part of the unit. I think that's what makes our units really effective. I think they know that. And as, as crappy as it was, this whole evacuation and what everybody went through and all these volunteers, I hope that at least the people around the world realize that the vets care. And I mean, they, they, we give a shit. And so, and it's odd because we're doing another documentary on uh, 
there's a bunch of smoke jumpers that recruited to go fight Laos in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. The CIA, right? So those guys brought over their partner force when we did him out out of there. Mm-hmm. And now you can go to Montana, like down in Missoula, and go to the the uh, uh, farmer's market, and there's all these mom. Yeah. Like, how did you guys get here? Yeah. It was all those guys. Yeah. They wouldn't give up. They literally, I mean, a lot of them on their own dime, man. They brought them in. Uh, it's just, in it's been awesome doing the documentary because we're talking to all these old heroes that are just modest as hell and you're just, it's awesome. But one of the things they all said is, and this before it happened, like you got to have a partner for us to trust you or we're not going to be able to do this. We're not going to be able to be that soft element that works with locals and builds these substantial units if they can't trust us. You can't leave these guys behind. And they and we did all these interviews way before this happened, so they were all they were all preaching to us. And these are mountain men; these are tough hombres. Um, you know, these guys are 80, 80 years old; they're still climbing mountains with no elk hunting, right? Dragging hundred pounds of elk on the shoulder off. These guys are not um, easily swayed by this stuff, but that really hit them all. And, and that like, you've really got, you got to be trouble. That really did, I mean, it, I mean, showed a big difference between, I don't know, I don't want to say it's necessarily our government because I, I feel like our government remains oblivious, but at least the influence that the service members have compared to how the Hmong and the Montagnards and whatnot were treated post-Vietnam, how all these people had to like use their own resources to get them out and you had the Vietnamese boat people and you had all these things where there was a very concerted effort and if I don't know how much, you know, at the, uh, you know, at the higher echelons of the government, they help, but, but they didn't hinder so far as I know, and allowed everybody to get what, get the things done that needed to be done to get our partner forces out. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's accurate from, the, from our interviews. Um, now, a lot of it was generated by the vets, though. Like, I don't know how many of those folks would have got out. Certainly ended up in Montana. Um, if it wasn't for the actual vets going, no, I'll, I'll pay for you. I yeah, mean, we, it, we talked to, yeah, we talked to one, one of the first one that came over, um, and he got here with his wife, and it was just one guy who bought him a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't have any. And then we were talking to him, we were talking about American story. His daughter graduated from Harvard, and his son graduated waiting for an MIT. Holy shit. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I was like, holy medical. That's an American story, right? This guy right. got here. He, he fought alongside our, our special op folks in Laos, and he got here with not a dime to his name, and now he's a successful businessman, and his kids are crushing it, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, but that's, and I hope people understand that that's what these Afghans can do too. Right. They're, they have proven that they are like-minded when it comes to, you know, the way they view the world. Yeah the way they view human rights for females, for example, that they fought for this themselves, mm-hmm. that they risked their lives just like our servicemen mm-hmm. and women did, and they will make good Americans. Mm-hmm. I know some people are, you know, have a different view of that, but I think they're going to be vetted well beyond what most people that come to the United States, mm-hmm. and they've already proved that they are the type of people that America needs uh, in the future. Yeah, those, I mean, the people, and that's, I mean, that's one of the things that, I mean, it frustrates me a bit is they think that they were just opening up birds, you know, C-130s, dropping the ramp and, and letting everybody run on board who was lining up. But but people were being vetted like they were people knew which unit they were attached to. They had, you know, it, it, these people, like you say, a lot of them died. A lot of them suffered. A lot of them were tortured for their affiliation with us. And this is the least we can do. Uh, I agree. Jackson, yeah. I mean, you kind of answered this one, Mick. Jackson asks your opinion of CAG, Dev Group, HRT. Well, they're awesome. I mean, I mean, you know, it's they are some of the greatest professionals we have in national security. Uh, CAG. I mean, we 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 recruit as many as we can. Quite frankly, in my own group, uh, CAG, Delta, uh, Dev Group. Um, I've worked with both. Extensively, they're some of the, the best soldiers and, and special operations folks that we have. 
Um, and they always will be. So, I mean, pe- people are more interested in that. I mean, we, we obviously need people to go into that direction too. Um, and, and, and in HRT, you're talking about FBI. Yeah. Uh, the FBI is going to come, I mean, they already are very important, but there's a, there's, there's a lot of issues with extremist groups in the United States. Uh, I'm not talking jihadist extremists. I'm talking, uh, extremist domestic on both sides of the aisle, right? People tend to only focus on the extremist groups on the other side of the aisle. Mm-hmm. I don't have an, a side of the aisle. I'm not a partisan person. But ABC did ask me, and I'm an analyst for them, to look at the issue and insurgency, if you will, because of my background, in the United States. And of course, I was like, well, I don't know anything about it. I haven't even lived here. Um, but it's pretty shocking. So there's a lot of groups that are forming based on this concept that there's going to be some kind of eternal strife up to and including a civil conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but at least from my research, it seems like they almost want to create the thing that they're claimed to be concerned right. about. Right, exactly. Um, right? And and that's not the way America should be. And this is both on the left and the right, uh, if you can even say left and right, because they're so far out there. Right. Uh, but anyway, so I bring that up because the FBI is going to play, they play a part in, you know, jihadist counterterrorism. They're also going to play the pivotal role when it comes to these type of groups in the United States right. and ensuring that they don't, you know, you know, uh, we had Jade Parker on who, who had done like extensive work against ISIS and then, you know, started looking at what was going on in the United States and kind of, I, I think she was kind of saying the same thing you were, is it, yeah, there's a left and there's a right and there are militant members of the left and there are militant members of the right. But then there's this other group that, really doesn't care. It's just trying to stir and, it up. And they just, they'll go wherever they think they'll cause the most trouble to make it look like whatever it is is bigger than it is um, sure. just to create, you know, this this unrest. Yeah. And I think, I, I don't have any facts to back this up because I'm not privy to it, but I think Russia exaggerates that a lot. I yeah. think so too. I think they, they find groups that are willing to create internal strife in the United States and they amplify it either through social media messages and potentially even, I don't know if they actually fund it, but it, it's something that uh, Americans should take seriously mm-hmm. because it is, and again, it's on both sides of the political aisle. Um, we need to put an end to it. Yeah. It's you, you gotta compete. If it's a democracy, you gotta compete in the in the, the arena of ideas. And if you're not successful there, then you're just not successful. You don't get to just pick up arms. And, and I mean, obviously, that's not why we're all we all fought for the United States. Right. Uh, Spencer asks: Are there opportunities to use the CIA internship program to spend time in the PMOO world through an internship? So what I would say. I don't know that we have, I guess we could have interns that serve there. So it's possible. But I would say in a broader question or answer, um, the agency is one of those things, if you get in the door, it's, it's, you can move around, right? It's, it's what I tell a lot of people that are applying is apply for a lot of stuff and don't just get like singularly focused. And a lot of our people from our background say, well, I just want to be a PMO. Okay. I understand that. But if you get in the door as an OO, you might like that. And you might have another opportunity to kind of go over there and prove your salt and become a PMO. Or you might start in a technical because they have, they have like special activities type stuff in the technical, BST, Director of Science and Technology. There's a lot of stuff to do. And, and an intern is a good way to get in there and get exposed to it. And maybe you'll find something that, oh, that, I really want to do that. So I highly recommend doing internships there. And I, I would highly recommend that if you are applying, that you don't limit yourself to just one path. Just apply for a lot of stuff. You get in. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways to to move around and find other things. And maybe you start off. I know I know analysts that ended up being PMLO. So they went like a totally different. They were the you know uh, they were in the analyst field, and then they became because of their background. They had the military background too. Mm-hmm. But they said, you know what? I'm not really ready just to write uh, analytical products, especially after 9/11 happened. So they came over. Right. So there's there's a lot of opportunities to move. 
So I'll uh, just consider that. Jackson asks also uh, if you have thoughts on Annie Jacobson's book. Uh, I don't. I don't. Which book is that? Um, I think she wrote a book about the agency. Uh, but... Was it Surprise Kill Vanish? Maybe. I think that was what it was. Right. So I've heard of it, but I, I don't haven't read okay. it. Okay. So. Sorry, I can't. Uh, really also asks, how much leeway do GB operators have when it comes to training? How does it compare to JSOC? So um, we do have, within the teams, we have a lot of leeway to conduct the type of training. We, we obviously have to hit the wicket, shoot, move, communicate, mitigate, you know, those kind of things. But we do have all, I, I would say, and I was just at a training course uh, for some SOCOM folks, and they gave me an opportunity to talk about my unit. So I was like, "Great, you just let the you know the, the fox in the hen house." Quite frankly, because I was going to recruit them all. But one of, one of the things I told them is, it is a civilian organization, and we function like a military unit. So we have a lot of we have more leeway. Put it that way. So there's, I mean, I'm a marine, love being a marine, military person, but there's a lot of the stuff in the military. That you don't have in the agency, and and in, in some ways it makes the things easier, right? It's you know there's a lot of stuff you got to do, you know, in the military that you don't have to do there, and it gives us a lot more, I think, freedom. And because we're a smaller group, people people tend to get more responsibility quicker, uh, just because we don't have a lot of people. Um, so I think that's that is a difference that I think exists between serving in a paramilitary capacity or in the military. You know, Mick, you, you kind of, you, you mentioned, you know, like the difference between the military and, and the paramilitary. When, were there growing pain? So we've had military people on who have talked about challenges with like the people at headquarters, not really understanding what the ground truth was. Um, you guys were in a situation where not only maybe the people whether it was at headquarters or in Kabul or whatever, may not have understood the ground truth, but their whole, all of their ideas about the military and special operations come from movies, video games, books, whatever. Um, were there growing pains for you guys just in relating to the, the civilian leadership? Yeah, I mean, you know, Somebody was joking with me the other day. It's like we used to send comps up to people who didn't even know what they were, right? So they'd kind of like, "Hey, man, if you guys think it's a good idea, go for it." You know, so it, in a way, that's good, right? Right. In a way, it's like in a way, you kind of do want somebody that's more senior to go. Yeah, I think you're all going to die, right? right? right. So <laughs> yeah, right, you, right. I'm curious. Right. I mean, right. I mean, most guys are like, "No, I know what I'm doing," but you might want that, you know, that. Lieutenant Colonel slash Sergeant Major to go, hey, you kind of missed a few things here. <laughs> um, and we do have that because we have PM guys up the chain, but sometimes you hit somebody who just doesn't have that experience. It's not, they, they're awesome at what they do, but they just don't know what it, what it entails to do an operation like conduct a raid in a uh, remote place in Afghanistan, for example. So it's good and bad. <laughs> you know, you, you get the, okay, if, that's what, if you guys think it's right, you know, go for it. But now it's, uh, I think it's, that was probably the way it started. Uh, one, the entirety of the DO has gotten very smart on right. our operations, even if they don't do them. Right. Two, we tend to have PM, senior PMs in a lot of positions now who can, and I'm not saying they just quash our ideas just to be that, and I don't think people do that. But they, they, they will give you that sanity check and make sure that you've done everything necessary so you don't you know, get in a bad place. Uh, Andrew asks this. I don't know if you how much visibility you may or may not have had on this, but he says regarding Operation Observant Compass and Eben Barlow was a previous guest on the show. If you can talk about the efficacy of uh, Barlow's guys and Bridgeway Capital's efforts to help apprehend Joseph Coney. Hmm. So I'm not, I, I know who he, what he's what Andrew's talking about. Um. I don't know enough about it to really give an opinion on the okay. efficacy. So I was, I was there in my capacity in the agency. Uh, I think the one, there was a lot of great folks from SOC app, um, from general Jim, uh, Linder, uh, Leahy, Derek Duke, 
a lot of guys that I think uh, working with the agency and the country team that was there, you know, um, really came up with a unique way to approach it. Because, I mean, you guys already mentioned it. Like, who the hell wants to fight kids, right? So there was not, not a lot of Green Berets and agency people that wanted to go confront the LRA. I mean, who wants to walk out of that firefight? You know, and a bunch of 14-year-olds and 12-year-olds. There. So they really, I think, and I give them a lot of credit, they came up with a way to do mostly influence operations. It was mostly to get people to defect. And they used, they used locals and they used, uh, like radio stations, mothers, because everybody listens to their mother, right? They get mothers on there to, to call out their son and not only tell them, like a mother, only a mother can, that they need to get their ass out of the bush, but that they could. Right. Like they would be accepted. Back. Right. Like we already talked about that. Uh, a lot of them are like, well, I can't go back because they'll kill me or they think I'm a horrible monster, a demon and all that kind of stuff. So I would say Observe and Compass was a great example of how to do irregular warfare and with the propaganda psyops, mm-hmm. not so kinetic, but keep them on the run. Um, and I think that, and it was a, it was a success. Uh, you know, we, we didn't catch Coney, um, but that's very difficult because of the, the enormity of the area that he could have been in. But it went all the way down to like below 300. At the height, it was like 22,000. Wow. So it was, it was below 300. So it was a failed insurgency, and it was essentially just existing to exist. They weren't a threat to anybody other than, you know, you know, a remote farmer or something like that. Um, I mean, obviously, I would like to see Joseph, Joseph Coney brought to justice, and he is still one of the most wanted men in the world. But the effort, Observer Compass, the combined effort, USG and the Ugandans, can't forget your partner force there, they were the crux of it, did a phenomenal job. Uh, it, and it did it, it did it in a way that didn't didn't have a lot of kinetic activity. It was mostly the, the psyop. That's amazing. I mean, it really is. Uh, Jackson asks, "How does the GB training pipeline compare to OTC?" So, OTC is the CAG. I don't know the details of that. Okay. So, um, I mean, I've heard, but I don't want to represent, especially if you have a bunch of CAG guys out there. If you're like, don't like guy, he doesn't. Look- uh, it's actually a, a former Delta guy, a friend of mine, who's here right now. Uh, um, but he, uh, to his question, the GB pipeline, he, and this is, I can't talk about because it's part of the thing that we tell people when it comes to recruiting. We already talked about it. You do the whole OO thing. That takes like a year plus. And that's just to be an ops officer. And then you have the PM course, and I don't know how long it is now, but it's not that long, but it's it's, I don't know, half a year uh, and then there's other versions later when you get more advanced. And it, it is, it is the point of that part, again, is not to, you know, weed people out and have a 35% fallout because they've already spent a gazillion dollars. And it's, you know, you've already proven your, your worth in all these other units. You're then selected. It takes forever to get in board because of the security. And then you've already gone through, oh, well, uh, you, you still got to be in shape. You still got to prove that you're, you know, capable. But it's mostly about teaching everybody how to be the together on a team that comes from all these different groups. So, I, okay. and then you then you go out and you do three to five years as a PM person. So you're in these units, you're doing this stuff, and then they usually want you to go prove your worth as an OO. Mm-hmm. I mean, you prove your worth in that capacity, but go do be a standard OO. And and can you go talk in a cocktail party and not you know sound like an O? It's true. You know, they, they want to see you do that and, and, and prove your worth there. And then you become, you kind of jump back and forth between the two worlds and you move up in management just like you do with the military. Uh, Lassick says, uh, it was always his dream to have a job like this, but it wasn't medical, medical, qual- medically qualified for the Army. Uh, he says, I hope to get uh, cyber sec- my master's in cybersecurity and then apply to the agency. Uh, but I can't shake my dream. Is there any way and still make it true with he has sclerosis, he says. Scoliosis, so, yeah. Scoliosis. So, I mean, I don't want to preclude anything. They have they have physical requirements for PMOOs. Um, but again, there's a lot of different skills in the agency, and you can uh, have all sorts of different physical abilities and still really contribute in the agency. 
Yeah, if so, he, he says he's getting a master's in cybersecurity, so something like scoliosis may not, you know, like in the DSNT or in whatever whatever cybersecurity might fall under, sure. it might not be uh, a disqualifier, right? I yeah, totally. Because you think about it, like the military, you have to be past a basic physical just to be a soldier, even if you're going to go into cybersecurity right? mm -hmm. or the Air Force, Army, Navy, same thing. The agency they. And I think they do a really good job of uh, facilitating uh, disability, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't necessarily need you to fill to be able to pass Army basic training physically, right? Because that's not what's needed for their version of cyber mm -hmm. warfare, right? So I do think there's, that's a good point. So I think there's a lot of things that people who may not qualify to, for the military because of different physical things could still serve in the agency in a very similar capacity. So, uh, you know, that is, that's a, a, a good point. I think that, uh, what was his name again? Uh, Isaac. Isaac should, Isaac, you should, uh, you should look into that because there's, there's opportunities you might not necessarily have in the military that you could have in the agency. Th this is another one you already kind of answered. Will GB take the lead over JSOC with kinetic activity as we transition away from the GWAT or has the dynamic changed? So I don't think we'll ever have a point where somebody will take like supremacy over. It it all depends on what's needed. So mm -hmm. if if we need to be able to not talk about it and not acknowledge it, then it's going to fall under Title Fifty. And although we can certainly utilize forces from JSOC, uh, it's prime predominantly PM. If it's something that we've decided, okay, well we're totally cool with taking credit for it. Um, JSOC, SOCOM is way bigger than the entire agency. So it's not just the PM component. So if we're, if we're like, hey, no, we need to have like the wrath of God come down uh, and we don't care that they know it, or maybe we want them to know it. Maybe we want them to know that you have that it, it's, it all, when it comes to the policy makers, right. it's that kind of things that they consider. What are the And then there's usually a place that both could fit. Yeah. Uh, how difficult is it for non-military civilian targeting officers to become a GB operator? I, that's pretty specific. Uh, how difficult is it to get your foot in the door like that? So I would say, and again, uh, there's a lot more than just uh, SAC, Special Activity Center. Um, almost all, if not 100% of the paramilitary uh, cadre are military, former military. The OOs are generally now 10 years with the special operations. The specialists are usually are retired. So they're 20 years plus. So, um, I'm not going to say it's impossible, you know, but I would say that there's so many other things you could do as a civilian targeter, like be a targeter. And now, that, now, here's what I will tell you. There's all sorts of folks attached to us. So there'll be a targeter that's working with, when I say us, but my old unit, right? So, and they have a huge impact, right? It's just like in JSOC. You go through some JSOC units and, you know, you'll find out. So, I mean, a lot of them aren't necessarily operators or whatever you want to call. Uh, they have all sorts of support and enabling skills that, just like us, we couldn't do our job with them. We just could, you know, and, and that's the way the world is now. It's, it is, you know, you think about the, the, now the artificial intelligence and all this new technology, we got to be able to adapt to that and cyber issues and all this stuff. It's going to be the units that are most effective are going to be a combination of all these skill sets where it's not about one individual, one skill. It's going to be like the fusion of all of them that allows us to outwit Russia, for example, uh, it's not just going to be assaulters. It's going to be all sorts of people. Speaking of which, uh, this is actually an interesting question. Uh, he's asking if you guys ever heard, um, if you have anything uh, to add to that story that was in the press about the Russians putting bounties on American soldiers. So I don't know if it was true or not. I obviously commented a lot from when it came out uh, as an analyst in the, in the news and such. I mean, if it is true, um, I mean, I certainly wouldn't pat, put it past Russia. They they essentially um, don't play the, by the same rules we we do. I mean, you had you had Mark on. Mark was invited to Moscow by the Russians. 
and then they use that weapon. Mm -hmm. I mean, how cowardly is that? We wouldn't do that. I mean, if we're going to fight them, we're going to fight them. We're not going to like invite them to go to the, ho the Ritz Hotel in downtown Washington, D.C., and then, then injure them for life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, I mean, I don't even tell you guys that. That's just unbelievable. Um, but they, they do things that we don't, uh, and they have no problem with that. So in bounties, I mean, I, I think it's, it's quite possible they did that. I don't know whether it's, if, whether they, if they did it, if that actually it, it made its uh, American soldiers were killed as a result. I don't know. Uh, I, I assume that somebody does, and if they do, they need to come up with a way, uh, uh, basically to go in the offensive. You know, I mean, we have to be defensive with the Russians. Well, you know, you can only be defensive for so long before you have to be offensive. Mm -hmm. And you have to start not violating our laws, not doing what they do. But we can't just let them get away with doing whatever the hell they want. I think you touched on this also. Uh, what does the career progression typically look like for a ground branch PMOO? Uh, how long or kinetic can an operator's career be? So for the PMOs, like I mentioned, they're kind of like the officers. So they expected to go do other things. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you have to serve in different areas. You have a kind of like a certain amount of time where actually in the, you know, doing the action stuff. Um, you know, eventually you're looking at your tactical gear that's sitting in the corner and it's never used and you're just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> but so, I mean, but some guys do manage to, because they just like, they say, you know what? I mean, they don't necessarily want to be the progression uh, and get all the leadership wickets. They just want to do the job. And so even in the PMO side, a lot of guys stay that way. So I think you you probably can do that more in the agency side of the house, the military side uh -huh. of the house, where they're very strict on your career path. And then, of course, paramilitary specialists, they stay, they stay operating. I mean, some of these guys, they're like grandfathers. Like, and you look at them, they look like grandfathers from the chin up, and then you look chin down you're like damn dude what the hell's going on down there i mean they're just like stacked you know and you're like putting your shirt back on it. but i mean they're still they're still managed to it's amazing that if you you know really take care of yourself eating and, and physically you know that guys can really last a long time um and then it becomes a lot of what's up here yeah. you know uh, so but you know, in, in in our world, even when you get to a point where you shouldn't be the guy, you know, going down the hall, we find we we don't want to get rid of people. Like we want that that knowledge. They, they become trainers. They become we come up with. You'd be surprised. We got guys that served in Vietnam are still actively involved with us. Not not in the operator sense, but in the the knowledge. Right. Right. You can't you can't you can't just fabricate that. These guys have a lot to offer. They stay with us a long time. Jim asks, uh, Douglas London wrote in his book, The Recruiter, the shift to covert action and paramilitary ops hurt the CIA's traditional mission. And what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think Douglas is a really smart guy. But what I would say is, the yes, there was a, a shift, but there's always been a paramilitary component to the CIA, right? So OSS, the, the SOE part, I mean, even our symbol is taken from that. So it's, it's ebbed and flowed based on what's going on in the world and what policy decision makers uh, decide. Um, I do think that the agency is quite capable of doing both. So, yes, we had, we got attacked on 9 11. We decided as a country we we're going to go to war in Afghanistan and for some reason to go to war in Iraq. And so the paramilitary component became very present, right? And then, of course, all the other places Libya, Yemen, Somalia, the Philippines. The agency the, the entire time still collected against China and Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Right. So it's, it, 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 yes, we surge resources, but I think we still have the capability of doing both. Uh, and I'd like to think that we should gear ourselves to be able to do both and not make it always an either or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because international security strategy and then the defense strategy that came with it, and I was at the Pentagon when we did that. We said China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and then counterterrorism was a list of priorities. But as you guys know, if something blows up in Times Square and 200 Americans are killed right. by three BBIDs, that fifth priority is going to go there. Right. And they might not actually reorder it, but we know how we think. We know how American politics and American public is. 
somebody's going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So, and we don't want to say, okay, well, I guess we're doing CT again. And then that we got to be able to do, because obviously it's a, going to war with China would be, you know, a substantial effort. And we don't know how it would turn out. Uh, but we still got to be able to do both. So I, I think uh, Douglas is a really smart guy and I've done some panels on him. But I would say we should be able to gear our intelligence community, our CIA, to do both uh, and be substantially effective at both. And uh, we're having Douglas on the show at the end of the month. I'm halfway through his book right now. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah. Jerry's asking, uh, did you ever do any work in Kosovo? Uh, it was before my time. A lot of one of my friends that were kind of the previous generations before mm -hmm. me uh, spent a lot of time. Uh, Mr. Brim asks a question here. A really good question, but uh, you already answered it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm feel like I'm making you repeat some of these answers. Uh, Jerry's asking about the Kuali E Jangi fortress situation. Is that where Mike Span was killed? Right, that is where he was killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's asking yeah. if you have an opinion about that about that situation and what happened there. Um, so I'm not quite sure what he means by an opinion. Uh, obviously, you know, that was early on. Uh, one of my friends were on his team. Uh, actually, one of my, two of my goddaughter's fathers were on his team. Um, I mean, Mike was a hero. He fought to the end. And uh, he, and if you talk to the Dave, the uh, case officer, Olo, that was a straight Olo that was with him. If it wasn't for his efforts, uh, he wouldn't have made it out of there, right? And another friend of mine uh, who got the, you know, Mark uh, Mitchell, um, got the Army Distinguished Cross, I believe, for his efforts to recover. So it's a very small community we live in, and then he was at the Pentagon with me and so on. Um, but, yeah, I'm so an opinion, uh, I think, and, you know, Mike was uh, the first casualty we lost in Afghanistan, and he went down as a Marine and as a paramilitary person would expect, he went down fighting. Uh, I'm also uh, going to have Toby Harden on who wrote the yeah, first casual. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's uh, Stuart, again, is just saying he's really proud of you. Uh, T-Bar asks, if you can offer your perspective on the U.S. military and intel commitment in Iraq and Syria moving forward. Uh, good question. So a lot of people have, you know, because there was such a, uh, political firestorm when it came to our presence in Syria. A lot of people don't know that we never left, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there was, and I was at the Pentagon there, and, you know, we lost the uh, Secretary Battis over that decision. Um, it was fantastic to work for. Um, but we never left. You know, quite frankly, the whole Pentagon kept doing this dance around, like, well, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. We're and, still down at and, and bless, Yeah. Because, uh, well, first of all, let's acknowledge the Herculean effort that went into building the SDF, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CAG guys particularly, but it wasn't just them. There was also SF guys and conventional guys, even National Guard guys on there. Because uh, I, was, I was a policy guy, I'd go visit these guys. They, that was an exceptional effort to build the SDF and to take it to ISIS with a handful, really small contingent of Americans. Um, that was phenomenal. Um, but the, the issue on, you know, stay, leave, etc. a lot of people that I've talked to, even who are very savvy in national security, are like, what do you mean? I thought we left. I was, that, that was a whole issue. No, we did. So we're still there. We're still, and we're obviously still in the rock. Uh, I would say that they have done a really good job at limiting their presence, cutting way down on the chances of casualties. We're never going to, you know, eliminate it. Um, and then the expense is not that high. And right now it's not perfect, but we don't have ISIS, uh, you know, starting a caliphate again. And we have an ability to push back against Iran in Iraq. Like if we're really serious about saying Iran's a higher priority, the last thing we would do is leave Iraq because then Iran would have no pushback, at least from any other people other than the Iraqis. And I think we've developed a very strong relationship with the Iraqi army. And again, in Syria, and I think both are worth continuing. So when it comes to the intelligence, and, and, and we need that for the intelligence picture to go directly to the question. If ISIS is going to come back, we need to know early so that we can affect it, shift forces, and quash it, and not have to wait till it's, you know, again, taken over the size of the state in the United States 
and then have to go and, and quite frankly, lose a ton of uh, of our partner forces. I think we lost eleven thousand SEF in that fight. I'll take. A, I'm going to take a couple more here, and then we got to wrap up with with Mick. Uh, the prior Army SF adapt better to the PM mission as opposed to other units. And did you know Evan Hafer of Black Rifle Coffee? So I don't know why uh, Evan. Uh, I, I do. I'm a big fan of Black Rifle Coffee. We bought a whole bunch to give the retreat folks that came here. Um, so yeah, I do. You know, I'm a Marine, of course, uh, but I think the SF. Um, there's a reason why I think SF was a really strong component, if not a majority component, inside of the PM world. Uh, I think it's a natural um, migration, if you will, to what we do, what they do. Although seals do great. Marines do great, um, but yes, I think I think, the, and there's a very strong connection between the PM world and the in the uh, Army SF community. Um, I've already told you about the paper we wrote with, uh, but that you know, fifth group and early on in Afghanistan, tenth group in uh, Iraq. Um, it's not that one is, but I, I would say that the the Green Beret community does really well for a reason in the paramilitary world, and there's a in 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 Really, uh, it's one of the main places where we recruit. A- Andrew asks, "Is Senate confirmation as fun as it looks?" So I was, I was in the, I was the DASB, and that is like the one down before you have to go to Senate confirmation, which was you dodged uh, the bullet. <laughs> I dodged the bullet, and again, I was <laughs> retired, and I was on my way to Montana. And I got a call from one of Sec- then Secretary Mattis's. Hey, he, he was actually looking for people who were not political. He just wanted people to actually been to the places that they were going to make policy on. And it wasn't like he really knew me. I mean, I, I met him. Right. But he was, he just heard from somebody else that, you know, I, I kind of had an inclination for, for this thing and I was retired. And I was like, damn it. I really want to go to Montana. And my son just happened to call right after he called or not. He didn't call, but his people and my son's a Marine. He was like, dad, you got him. You can't like say no to General Mattis. Damn it. <laughs> so, I, so I did. And I learned a lot. And that's one of the things I did want to bring up. So, um, you know, I was just a ops guy. I went and, you know, I was always one of those guys. If I was making policy, you know, I was, then I was the dog that caught the car. Right. But I would point out that and there's probably a lot of your audience that are currently serving. If you have an opportunity to do policy, even at the, after you're done, do it. Because, you know, there's, all, there's all sorts of really smart people in policy and they have their own skills and I'm not saying that they can't do it, we should. And I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that we have a different perspective mm-hmm. that would benefit the policy making process if we did it, especially at the end of our career. Yeah. Uh, in whatever position you could find where you're not just taking orders and trying to shape your con ops based on, you're actually saying, look, I've spent time on the ground this is what I think, and this is what I think our policy should be, and this is why. Not just the military or the State Department, Intel, whatever. But I would put a plug in there that uh, that we need the voices of the people who have spent a lot of time on the ground mm-hmm. in the policymaking uh, process. Uh, the agency recently changed their website and broadened the recs for jobs and ops. Do you think this is because of a recruiting issue or something else? Run the requirements. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Do you mean, uh, Cass? Do you mean like open them up or, or relax the requirements? Or if he wants to clarify, yeah. Um, if you want to clarify, we'll Jerry look for says it. thank you for the awesome show. Jackson says, uh, how easy difficult is it recruiting JSOC operators, officers for PMOO position? I feel like we we've asked this question like ten different times, beating around the bush here, guys. Um, so I think that's that's pretty much gets us to the end of the questions. Um, Mick, is, is there anything I failed to mention? Anything that I failed to ask, or anything that you would like to talk about? Whether it's with your charity work with the Lobo Institute, uh, MEI, anything that you're working on that you'd like uh, to bring to people's attention? Jack, I think we covered everything. I would say, and it's another it's another plug to our people, if you will. They're eventually going to retire. And a lot of us will do retirement things and they'll do things that we're comfortable with. And I understand that because that's what we know. But I'd also say add to that 
something that is outside of your area. For the same reason I brought up the policy. Like we also, we worked for the, uh, we did, we, we, we worked with the UN on Yemen, right? There's not a lot of guys like me and Eric in the UN. Right. Right. But we brought a different perspective. Again, it's not superior to anybody's perspective. Right. It's just different than people who work in the UN. Um, so I think a lot of the folks in your audience uh, could do the same thing. So I'm not saying don't, don't, you know, stay in your skill set, but also look for other ways to have, you know, work for, with an NGO. Like you got a lot of good people that are trying to go do good things, but they don't know how to do it safely. So maybe that's the input. Maybe you go work for an NGO where you can bring your, your survivability skills that would allow these do-gooders who are really out there doing the right thing, but don't know how to stay safe. Right. Or it's the UN who has policy. So I would say um, it's, it's there's a lot that, that they have to offer. Consider other policy, consider other areas, especially when they retire, that they can really have an impact. Guys, thank you for tuning into the show this Friday. I really appreciate it. Make sure that you give us a little thumbs up, share the show uh, with your friends, like us on Instagram, all that good stuff. There's a link down in the description to get access to our Patreon if you want to help support the show. Uh, next Friday, we're going to have Luis Fernandez on the show. He was an 82nd Airborne officer, served in Afghanistan, uh, got in some hellacious firefights up in the mountains as a with, a, with a, an infantry platoon. He was a PL. Um, so we're looking forward to talking to him next Friday. Um, uh, check out LoboInstitute.org and um, check out the uh, the foundation on uh, Stop Children, uh, Children Soldiering, right? Yeah, and child soldiering. Yep. And, and child soldiering. Cool. Um, oh, and Mick, uh, one last thing. When you finish that documentary about the smoke jumpers in Laos, yep. I'd like, I'd like yeah. to have you back on the show to talk about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, we would probably get you one of the smoke jumpers, too. That'd be great. We That'd would be love to. Because once they start talking, you're not going to hear from me because those guys are hilarious. Fair, I mean, fair those enough, guys yeah. are really like salt of the earth. But yeah, we'll definitely well, do that. Well, you know what? Okay. I mean, just try and get everybody to New York. We'll sit around the table and get drunk. <laughs> we'll get shitty and just like have fun. Yeah, you can learn a lot. Yeah, those, I bet. That would be amazing. Yep. That would be have. amazing. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Mick, for spending some time tonight with us. Really, yeah, really appreciate, appreciate it, it, man. Um, 